Hey guys, thanks for joining us for this second episode in Season 4 of Good Questions with Cameron Dole. Special guest on this episode includes singer-songwriter Ree Matei, who has a new single we'll be talking about, You Got Two Wheels. We'll also talk with Cutter Elliott about his new single, Come On Home, and his work with the Autism Foundation. And we'll also talk with our good friend and songwriting legend, Kent Blazy, talking about his new album, From the Beatles to the Bluebird. Of course, if you would, please take the time to subscribe, comment, leave some feedback, and of course, share with your friends. Now, people used to regret the tattoo they got on spring break, and now it's going to be the tattoo they got at their cousin Chad's wedding. What? Well, tattoos are the new party favor to offer at your wedding. People are hiring them as vendors so guests can get ink during the reception. Now, the idea is to give people a permanent memento to remember your wedding by. A wedding photographer in Kansas posted a video last week after a client hired a tattoo artist for their cocktail hour. Now, they're not free. You had to pay a set price of $60, and they weren't offering full sleeves, just simple outline tattoos. Now, some people think it's a cute idea. Others think it's weird, maybe unsanitary, and would be awkward if none of your guests wanted one. Now, either way, most of them agree to doing it early in the reception is the way to go. You don't have tattoos available once everyone's drunk. All right, guys, promised you another special guest on the podcast, uh, YouTube as well. Got a new single that has been out since the 4th. You Got Two Wheels is the name of the single. We've got Remus Hay with us, and uh, I didn't ask the pronounce, pronunciation of the last name. I, I'm hoping that I came close on the last name, but uh, I knew I got the first name right. You did great. <laughs> <laughs> now, Reem, tell us, uh, tell us a little bit. Uh, first off, let's just go ahead and... Talk about the, the the new single that's that's available out there right now. Tell us your thoughts on it, how excited you are to have it uh, out there for folks to be delving into right now, if you will. I'm really excited because actually um, it was it was ready like in 2019 and then COVID hit and uh, I have a whole like album ready to be released. And so I had to kind of wait because I wasn't sure there was a lot of uncertainty and a lot of things going on. So it's a great summer song. And I think that like everything happens for a reason that it was delayed because actually now it came out exactly the time of year. I really wanted it to come out. You know, it's about a girl in a Starbucks and she sees this guy come, well, you know, come riding up on a Harley and there's this like instant connection and he's not the kind of guy she, that she would normally be with. You know, it was just kind of like odd and unexpected, but it, like she hops on the back of this bike and it's like a love story and they're together forever. So it's, it's just like a cool song, whether you ride a bike or not, but it's a, you know, everybody, the, the, the remarks I'm getting so far, it's like a toe tap and it makes you want to sing along. It's a positive song. It's a happy song. And I think we need those out there right now. That's right. Well, I, I don't have a, I don't ride a motorcycle, but I do have a trike. So uh, I, I can, I can play it while I'm riding the trike. That's good. That's good. Now, uh, I, I did not expect to have another special guest, but he decided to join in my lap. Uh, we've got, oh. I'll introduce him to you. This is Eddie. He's new, Hi, to, Eddie. he's new to the family. He, uh, he decided he wants to sit in dad's lap. So we do have another uh, uh, guest host with us today. So if he pops his head up, don't be surprised. <laughs> I love animals. I have two Shih Tzus. They're love of my life. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, well Eddie, hopefully he won't, be, he won't be doing any talking today. Uh, that's what we're hoping for. So, so Ree, I want to talk a little bit about uh, where the start for music, the love of music in your life. Where did that, where did that get started? Or do you even remember a time where music wasn't first and foremost in your life? Honestly, I really don't remember a time that it wasn't because I, I, I have a few memories at three years old, but my biggest memory I have is at five years old. I love to swing on swings outside and so I was swinging on the swing, and I had this little Mickey Mouse radio that I would listen to country music on. And I just jumped off my swing, and I remember running into my mom and saying, what do these people on the radio do for a living? <laughs> she said, they sing. You know, that's what they do. And I said, well, that's what I'm going to do then. And so that's where it kind of started, and it just never 
ended that passion for music. I started writing songs when I was nine years old. I used to take my microphone and I had this garbage can. I'd stick my microphone in a garbage can to get the resonance. (laughs) <laughs> and I would record over my favorite artists like Linda Ronstadt. And at dinner time, my poor family had to listen to the new album that I did <laughs> for the day. So that's how it all began. Yeah, I know you have a varied musical interests as well. Uh, it goes from, uh, well, I- I'll let you tell. Where Was that heavily influenced by, by your parents' love of music as well? Yeah, you know, um, I just remember like every day there'd be music playing around the house, whether mom was making cookies or, you know, dad get home from work. There was always music. And a lot of times it was country music and a lot of traditional country. So I grew up with like Loretta Lynn and Waylon Jennings and Tammy Wynette and um, that traditional kind of country. So there's that kind of roots of country that you'll hear in my stuff and, and a lot of my stuff along with the contemporary. And then mom also liked to listen to like Neil Diamond. And then I remember as a kid um, going to see Harry Chapin uh, several times. He was such a great singer, songwriter, Um, Mac Davis, you know, so those were my influences and it just made me want to be a singer songwriter. For you, what is that? What's the biggest challenge in the songwriting process? Is it coming up with the original inspiration? Is it maybe, Uh, the bridge, is it maybe being finalized and not having to be edited anymore? What's the, what's the toughest part for you? I think, um, you know, I always have ideas. I have like a book of ideas. So when I go into a songwriter, you know, uh, if, if I have an appointment with a songwriter, I bring a bunch of ideas. So I think the hardest part is really just coming up with that hook and melody that's going to make the song and agreeing on that. And once that happens, the song kind of writes itself most of the time. And um, I've been very fortunate to, ha- to have a lot of good songwriters write with me. Um, and they're artists in their own right, a lot of them. So they understand the process of, you know, um, your brand and, and, you know, is this song going to be a, a song for you? And many of them were unselfish. You know, they put their own brand aside and said, okay, we're writing for Reed today. You know, what? What does this song need to be so that we can record it? And, you know, I'm grateful for that. Now, now tell us, where did, uh, when did you first pick up the guitar and, and how, uh, tell us how the love of the guitar has gone for your life as well. So I remember being, I think I was 11 or 12 when I uh, got a guitar. And the reason I got a guitar was because I was writing a lot of songs, of course, you know, and, uh, Of course, those dinner times when I played my album, um, I think it was my father that finally said, "We, you know, you need to be able to accompany yourself, which is probably one of the greatest things that um, that he ever said, because it is an as a singer songwriter. Now, it's nice if you can accompany yourself and be able to do that. You know, it helps with songwriter nights and just being able to create your song and bring across, you know, even in the studio, I would always have a work tape and me on the guitar singing it so I could bring across for them what I was wanting the song to kind of sound like. And then what happened was I took lessons um, for a while from, he was a guitar teacher for Jim Croce for a while, and this was back in New Jersey. And then I met this guy named Tony Pesh, who was a guitar teacher, and he started teaching me out of the Berklee College of Music books. And uh, so he really taught me a lot of like sight reading And um, so I could open a book and just, you know, play with the notes that were there. And he had sent me home with an an album, an LP. And he said, tell me what you think of this. And it was Wes Montgomery. Wow. And it was at that point that I just fell in love with the guitar. And uh, that was because that was my first experience. And I'm like, wow. And he said, yeah. And he played with his thumb. I said, oh, my gosh, you're going to be kidding me. Um, Great player. So that's when it kind of started for me. And I know I told you how the last 18 months have been trying and uh, in in my life personally. And so I think one of the things I want to talk about in our podcast is also how we get through times. And and I know for me personally, I I don't play guitar. I've got a guitar. I, my dad, we, we never learned guitar young. So I, I learned piano. So whenever I'm frustrated, whenever I'm going through stuff, I have I get sit down at the piano and I play "A Long December" by The Counting Crows. 
when you're having a bad day, what do you sit down? What do you pick up on the guitar? What what plays you back into a good mood? On, honestly, you know, it's funny you say that because um, there was a time I went through a really bad time in my life. And instead of picking up my guitar, I put on my headphones and the song that I played that got me through it. And I would just sit there till like two o'clock in the morning and rock back and forth with my headphones on and cry. Tears would just pour down my eyes. And it was Travis Tritt's Anymore, yeah. that song. I was going through a really bad breakup. And all I could think of was that person that wrote that song, they know what I went through. Mm. You know, and I believe Travis Tritt picked that song because obviously it resonated with him too. And I thought if the writer and Travis Tritt, you know, got through whatever they went through because obviously they've been through things, then I'm going to get through this too. And that that's the song. That was my go-to song that's cool. for that time. That's cool. I've never asked that question before. So I've, uh, that, that one just popped up to me. So now, now tell us uh, – since everything was pushed back because of COVID, I mean, so much, it, it's hard to believe that we're still talking ab- about things that were affected by COVID, but, <laughs> it, it, how far reaching it's been, how moving forward now with the single moving into the latter part of 2023, that seems so hard to believe as well. Uh, w- what are your goals moving into this year into 2024 as well? The goal for me is I really want to, start to get out and play more. Um, You know, I also work full time right now as a nurse practitioner, as I work on my career. And um, I want to be out there meeting everybody, you know, and I've done that before. Um, I'd stopped during that time period, you know, COVID and after, but so now, I mean, I'm just really am wanting to get back into the venues and starting to do that and have more people hear my music. Mm. Cause you know, my motto has always been, Music is my medicine. I hope my music can be your medicine because it is so therapeutic and it does help people through so many things, you know, the happy songs and the sad songs. Mm -hmm. So that's my goal is is to just be out there with the people and meet them and hang out with them Mm -hmm. and play for them. That's right. Now, so, so you're, you're treating them so many different ways here. And how, how did the whole COVID thing, obviously your first hand there, how, how did that, change the way you approach music and the live performance? You know, um, w- during that time, I did some live um, shows on Instagram and Facebook, you know, tried to reach people that way. Mm-hmm. And actually, I feel like, you know, the, the music industry, when you look at it, we, we're doing a lot more things through, you know, YouTube, Skype, and, and online things that I don't think would have happened if, if COVID hadn't happened as, as much as it does now. And it really has stayed. So I really learned to use other platforms more mm-hmm. and, um, and reach people that way. Because when you think about it, you know, now we, we can reach people in New Zealand and the UK, you know, all over with technology now that we, we may have never been able to reach before. Mm. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Now, now, what was uh, what was your first Zoom experience like in 2020? Your first one, as opposed to now. I mean, your background, everything looks great. What was what was that first connection like? It was interesting because, okay, <laughs> for me, I'm such a face to face person, oh. and kind of like I like to hug people. So there's that, you know, you have to get used to that. It's almost like when you're in the studio and you finish a song and then there's this silence and you're like, <laughs> did people like it? Won't, will they like it? Whereas live, you get an instant feedback, mm-hmm. you know? So you get the comments, but then I'd have someone else, you know, doing the, the recording and they would let me know what the comments were so I could, you know, re- reply back. So I feel like it was a little bit of a delay in getting used to that, that way of uh, reaching people and communicating with people. Now I'm getting a lot more used to it you know, than I was before, but it was definitely a change and a little bit scary too. Cause you're like, <laughs> I hope, I hope it's working. Cause like at first, if you don't see any comments, like, am I live? Are yeah. you seeing me? You know? Yeah. Our station, uh, the station I was working for at the time we were hosting them on, on my page as well. And yeah, I remember the, the first one when they first started, it was, Oh man, it was train wreck. And by the, by the time, you know, a couple months were underway, everybody was kind of, they were putting shows together by that point. So it was mm-hmm. pretty cool. 
So uh, tell us the uh, what what is uh, what's the next venture for you after uh, after the current release? Well, um, the plan is well. I've got several things going on right now. One of them I'm really excited about is I have created my first music video. I have other music videos out, but I did this one myself. So, and it's for the you got two wheels, and I'll, I have another one I'm working on. So there'll be two videos that will be coming out. The release of the first one will be August 21st and um, we'll kind of like lead up to that, you know, on social media and let people know. So there'll be, there'll be that going on. And then I plan to release two more singles um, from the album. And then the album I plan to release in in November digitally. But my, uh, but what I'm going to be doing is actually within the next month is making physical copies of the album. So people at shows will be able to purchase it early if they want to and have it, you know, uh, but as far as digitally, it will come out in uh, late November. That's good stuff. Well, well, Ree, if uh, folks want to keep up social media wise, website wise, keep up with uh, upcoming events as well, where's the best place for everybody to keep up with you? So you can go to rematei.com. That's R E M A T T E I.com. And when you go on there, it'll pop up or you can join. They call it a fan club, but it's, it's a, like an email um, and I let people know where I'm playing, what I'm doing, you know, how they can download my stuff. Um, also, if you go on my social media in the link tree, it has all my links to all my social media and to download the new song, You Got Two Wheels, is there also. And if you go on Spotify, please follow me and, and check out the song there, too, uh, especially because Spotify really helps people get in venues and play places. You know, a lot of venues do look at Spotify. That is good. Uh, again, the new single, You Got Two Wheels. Check it out. And uh, Ree Mate, it has been a true privilege to have the chance to visit with you today. And uh, hopefully we can catch up again real soon. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it, Cameron. What age do you think someone has to hit before they're officially old? Well, ignore those sore knees and constant hemorrhoids because according to this, most of us are not old yet. A new Harris poll asked more than 2,000 Americans, and you're not officially old now until you hit 80. Now, obviously, we're staying healthier in our 70s more, but does 80 really make sense when life expectancy is just 76? Now, people were also asked what old looked like when their grandparents were their age. Now, back then, we think 60 was considered old. Now, one reason it doesn't seem so old anymore is seniors are acting younger. Most people agree that Americans 60 and up are more active than they used to be and more willing to try new things. Now, seniors are also more optimistic about their future. 71% say the best days of their life are happening now or are in still in front of them. Our next guest on the podcast uh, from the nearby vicinity, actually just a couple of hours up the road in Norman, Oklahoma, Cutter Elliott with us today. And Cutter, I I, I was surprised to find uh, that, that we had somebody this close to us that uh, that I hadn't heard heard of yet. So Cutter, nice to meet you. Looking forward to uh, to getting to know you a little better today. Nice to meet you too, buddy. Thank you for having me on. Now, now, Cutter, tell me when uh, when did you first know that you that music was uh, was a special place in your life? Where where was where did you know that music was uh, was something uh, near and dear to you? When I was about four years old, my mom's dad, my papa, introduced me to the music of Johnny Cash, and because of my autism, I fixated on Johnny. And ever since I was four years old, I, that's what I've wanted to do. Now, who Johnny Cash is? Is he the biggest influence uh, on your music? Is he the one that uh, that maybe turned you on to the love, if you will? Yes, and then uh, later became George Strait and Merle Haggard, and then most recently, I, I really like listening to uh, Dwight Yoakam and Buck Owens. I've been listening to a lot of their music as well. Was it was it family? Maybe parents, grandparents, uh, or or just sitting around radio, or uh, maybe some old records. Where was uh, where was your uh, where did you tickle that fancy, if you will? My papa introducing me to to Johnny Cash and and the traditional country music, definitely. Now, as far as writing is concerned, where did uh, when did you first write, and uh, and how much different are uh, the the songs you've written today, and if you stack them up against some of those early writes, if you will. Well, I'm, I would still consider myself an early 
early songwriter. Um, I, I really uh, have been mentored by my uh, manager and, and producer, Paul, and he's he's been mentoring me over the last several years on on writing. And I'm still in the early stages of of uh, of writing. And and being like I said, early stages of, of writing, and also we're it's hard to believe it's 2023, but we're still talking about coming out of COVID and and how that has affected new artists. And for you, how has how has that affected you and and the ability to get out and play? Have have the the opportunities uh, picked up a little bit lately, if you will? Yeah. Um... It, it was slow in during uh during COVID, but I still went out and played a few places um, around uh, Oklahoma because I just uh, I lived in, in Oklahoma up until January mm. and uh, I moved out to Nashville to to pursue uh, this career and been touring radio out of Nashville for the last uh, few months. Um, but actually, COVID didn't really slow me down because a lot of the the places that I played were outside. Mm. And so I, I continued just, to, I continued to play. And then when I moved uh, to Nashville, I've mostly been focusing on visiting radio mm. or so, but I do have some events coming up in uh, September, opening up for Thompson square. Yeah. And uh, that we're looking forward to up in Michigan for uh, fraternal or fraternal order of police shows, FOP shows out there in Michigan that we're looking forward to doing. And then I'm also a proud ambassador for the autism speaks foundation. And we have uh, they have walks uh, every year, and uh, I'm going to be speaking and performing at, at their walk in uh, St. Louis, Oklahoma, Kansas, and Texas this year wow. in October and, and November. So that's I'm really cool. To doing those as well. Now, now to be a part of that, talk. Let's let's talk about that a little bit. For as far as as chasing your dream and and the, some of the challenges that you face in the day to day that maybe. Uh, you can inspire others and maybe show others that there is, there is a way beyond uh, what, what some people would say there is no way, if you will. Absolutely. Um, I, I have to give credit to my mother um, because she uh, always encouraged me to do what I wanted to do, which was sing and, and play, play guitar. And I also play a little golf on the side too. And, and there are two things she told me every day from the time she dropped me off at school from when I was a ba- a kid to, uh, when she dropped me off at college, she would always tell me to spread some joy. And uh, she would always tell me can't never could anytime I told her I can't do this or I can't do that. And uh, as a matter of fact, Paul and I wrote uh, the song can't never could. Um, and that's going to be the autism speaks theme song mm. this year. That, and we're very proud of that. I have a, a recording of it on, uh, you can get it on my uh, website, cutterelliot.com, and 100% of the proceeds from that download we're going to donate back to Autism Speaks. And uh, and I also have a documentary out um, called Can't Never Could on my YouTube channel that tells my life story as well. Um, but back to your question, I just try to always encourage everybody to do whatever it is that they want to do. And, and for you, each day that you go, as you get new listeners and, and new people that are touched by the music, what does that mean to you on a personal level? It's great. I, I absolutely love it. And, and uh, you know, I hope that I can impact somebody's life like Johnny Cash and George Strait have on me. That would be amazing. Mm-hmm. And as you as you look forward to the to the upcoming shows, the the Thompson Square uh, shows as well, uh, Shauna and uh, and Kiefer, what a great group of uh, a, a great group of folks they are, and and to see the folks like that to have a belief in you, what, what's that mean for you early on as well? Oh, it's it's great. You know, I'm 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 looking forward to, to meeting them. At the, you know, I'm I'm excited to to work with them. Mm. I love their music and and I think. Th- they seem to be really nice people. I've never met them, but but from uh, it, talking to other people that know them, they say that they're great. And and uh, he's a fellow Oklahoman. Uh, exactly, exactly. Uh, they're up north, uh, northeast, I believe. Yeah, up in Miami, Oklahoma, yeah. is where he's from. And and you can tell we're both Okies because we know how to say that city's name. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It drives me nuts when people say I'm in Miami, Oklahoma. I'm like. No, you're not. 
It's in Florida. <laughs> You're nowhere close, Miami, Oklahoma. Oh, no. yeah. <laughs> now, now, what was the what was the 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 biggest maybe aha moment since you've been in Nashville? I've been to Nashville several times myself, and I I know the city just has an aura and a vibe that that kind of gets into your soul. What was what was the first time that uh, the the first experience for you that you were kind of like, yes, that I, this is the this is where I'm supposed to be. Uh, I was, I was on a, uh, visiting radio and, uh, that night after I got home, I got a message from a lady who, um, who, whose daughter has cerebral palsy and autism as well. And I found out she, um, is, uh, a tour guide at Johnny Cash's farm in Bon Aqua, Tennessee. And she invited me to come out and that was, and I got to go out and, and meet them and sit in Johnny Cash's chair and play Johnny's guitar. And, and, uh, I had actually met Johnny's nephew who works out there about a year before that. And I got to see him again. And then when I walked in, he was actually singing one of my songs on the stage. And right then I was like, man, this is, this is awesome. <laughs> that, it doesn't get much better than that, does it? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. Now, aside from the shows up in Michigan, uh, t- tell us uh, a little bit about uh, where c- what folks can expect uh, from the website on, on the YouTube page. And and I know that the new single, Come On Home, I wanted to give you a chance to talk a little bit about that as well. Yeah, Come On Home is a song that I, I co-wrote with Paul, my, my manager and producer. And uh, it has that traditional Waylon Jennings sound, outlaw country, if you will. And that's what drew me to the song. And, uh, you know, it's just the old tale of a guy telling his wife or girlfriend that he changed his ways. If she just comes on home. There you go. And, uh, and for, for you, the classical in the, in the lyric, in the, in the songwriting and in the presentation, how important is it for you to, to have that and to stay that authentic, if you will? I think it's, it's extremely important because, uh, you know, country music, uh, you know, is is kind of stirred away from from its traditional sounds, and kind of gone more pop or rock. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but um, you know, I grew up as I said before, listening to Johnny and Merle and George, and and that's what I love. And I don't want to see that go away. That's part of my mission to make sure that it that it keeps, you know, keeping traditional country music alive. And as far as where you can find my music, uh, CutterElliott.com. I've got uh, the Heartache Waiting to Happen album that you can physically order, and I'll sign it for you and send it to you. Or you can you can digitally download it as well. I also have some some other singles on there on my website. Um, as I said before, Can't Never Could uh, is on there as well as uh, I think four or five others. And uh, I'm on all streaming services. You know, anywhere you can stream music uh, spotify apple music um youtube so i'm out there well uh again cutter great to visit with you today and uh hopefully we'll catch up again real soon sounds great boomer sooner no matter how you feel about her personally or artistically this has been taylor swift's year so she seems like the obvious choice to headline the Super Bowl halftime show. Well, it may be too early to speculate about this stuff, but there's already reports that Taylor's been offered the gig and turned it down. Although a source says it's possible that Taylor is just angling for, quote, a big check from the NFL rather than incurring the substantial cost of mounting the show. Now, halftime performers don't get paid for the gig. They pay whatever it costs to perform. Now, it would be pretty insane, but let's be honest, it would also be crazy impressive if Taylor actually got the NFL to pay her. All right, guys, always great to have uh, guests on back on the podcast, especially friends like this guy, Kent Blazy, back with us. And Kent, excited to talk about the new project. I mean, uh, we, we've had this interview a couple of different times uh, scheduled before. Uh, life came up in front of it for us, but uh, excited to talk with you about this new project, brother. Well, same here. You know, it's it's something that just I was over in Liverpool last year and uh, got to go to the Beatles sites. And on the dock there, they have uh, these statues of the Beatles that are pretty cool. If you Google, all of them are holding something in their hand that means something to them. 
which I thought was pretty cool. But I got my picture taken with them on the dock, and I had a Bluebird sweatshirt on that day because it was so cold. And somebody took a picture, and I saw it, and I thought, that's a great album title because, you know, everybody's been influenced by the Beatles. And then if it hadn't been for the Bluebird, giving Garth Brooks the chance to do If Tomorrow Never Comes, who knows where everything would be. Right. So I thought it was pretty cool. And uh, so that's kind of what I started aiming for. And so many people don't understand what happened when the Beatles played on Ed Sullivan that night, you know, and this is kind of to refresh maybe younger people with it because, um, you know, I was just a little kid, but I remember Kennedy had been assassinated in November and the country was really depressed like they were during 911 after that happened. You know, everybody's just wandering around in a fog. And then the Beatles come on Ed Sullivan on February 9th, 1964. And more people watched than had ever watched TV before. And it just changed the whole energy of the country, you know, and then it took off from there. All the people came from England, all the great bands and stuff like that. And, um, you know, the Beatles had so much impact on society and how we think and the music we listen to and all that. And it's still echoing on with McCartney out there playing and Ringo still playing today. And for you, what's what is it about the Beatles music that that still reverberates and, and also lends itself to so many other genres? I mean, I don't think there's been a genre that hasn't done a take on a Beatles classic, have there? No, you're exactly right. I mean, it's been from Symphony. Um, I was telling my wife I had an old West Montgomery uh, album, and he was an amazing jazz guitar player, and he did a whole album of Beatles songs. <laughs> and um, it's just they came along and did something that nobody else had ever done. They took music to a totally different place and they kept reinventing where they were taking music. You know, uh, these guys were doing three albums a year for the first three or four years, which to me is phenomenal. Right. And then they got into the whole Sergeant Pepper and white album and rubber soul. And they were taking music in a totally different way and influencing like the beach boys and the beach boys were influencing them. And it, it's just music that has lasted and it's music that was so different for its time that now you try to tell some kids about it. It's like, Oh, that sounds like everything else. But you know, at the time they're the originators of it. Um, just like my last album was called for the birds. And it was about uh, me being influenced by their sound. And, you know, now a lot of people might have that sound, but back then nobody was doing what they did. Right. And, um, it's still kind of that way to me when I go back and listen to Beatles songs. Nobody was doing what they were doing, and nobody's still doing what they were doing. Now, as you were working on this project, I'm sure you, you delved into a little history, wanted to, to delve into the, the Beatles. Was there was there ever anything that was truly a surprise that you were like, maybe an aha moment uh, of, of some Beatles lore that you you'd never stumbled upon before, maybe? Well, you know, I was lucky when I was over in Liverpool, I got to go to Penny Lane and Strawberry Fields and then see the houses where they grew up in and one house that McCartney lived in with his dad till he was like 22 or 23. And you just don't picture Paul McCartney, one, being that young when all this stuff was happening, <laughs> but also to still be living at home at 22 or 23 when he's a Beatle, mm -hmm. you know, it's pretty amazing. And tell us a, a little bit the the process of writing this was were, did you have writer's block at any time or was this just one of a, a, a seamless uh, from from beginning to end if you will? It really was a seamless thing from beginning to end. It was very surprising. Um, I just kind of knew what I wanted to say about the Beatles and especially about Paul McCartney, such an inspiration being out there and playing in his eighties and still singing in the same key he does. And Dylan's out there and uh, Willie Nelson. And, and it shows us that we don't have to quit because we've hit a certain age. And that's very inspiring for me because I still love playing electric guitar with my band and uh, doing rider shows or whatever. And, uh, you know, people go, well, are, when are you going to retire? I'm like, why do I want to retire? I'm having fun. <laughs> and uh, that's kind of what I was aiming for this album is just have it be fun and have people remember what it was like to have that energy of, of what it was like to hear the Beatles. 
and no matter how old you were and no matter if you just hear them for the first time today. And then the other cool thing is we cut the 10 songs in one day, like the Beatles cut their first album, you know, and that's because I have such great players with me. But um, the way we cut them, the way we tracked them was the way it ended up being in the sequence on the album, which never has happened to me before, but it just had a flow right from the beginning to the end, I guess, from tracking live like that. Hmm. Now, what what was that day like? I mean, what how was that day unlike any any other day that you spent in studio, maybe? Well, I've, I've used the same people uh, three or four times now. Um, two of them play with John Party, the bass player and drummer, because I like the bass player and drummer to always been working together. And Steve Allen was the other guitar player. And we were going for a different sound than we had on any other album. We were just going for that two guitars, bass and drums, like the Beatles Mm -hmm. and all of them. I mean, uh, Lee, he's way younger than the rest of us, but he just, he knows what to do, you know, on every song and they knew what to do. And it just was pretty seamless. You know, a lot of these were one take, uh, cuts, you know, and that's pretty amazing too, but it shows the caliber of these musicians and Steve Allen, such an incredible guitar player. When I listen back, cause I, I'm singing and playing at the same time and they're all playing. And so you, sometimes you miss what the other people are doing because mm-hmm. you're so wanting to get it right for you. But I go back and listen to all the amazing little parts that he did that were so beatily, but fit so perfect in what we we were doing. And I just have to laugh when I hear this stuff that's like, wow, that to me is magic. Mm. And uh, this was uh, the first time we didn't have to go in and wear masks Mm -hmm. and stay six feet apart and wash our hands after every take and all that. (laughs) And I think there was something joyous about that. And then this time we cut in the A room of Sound Emporium, which we never had done before. And that was just a magical room. It kind of had a feeling of like Abbey Road might have or something, you know, and everybody just felt so comfortable there, but loved the sound of what that room created that uh, it just added to the fun of it. And for you to see the appreciation of a younger generation, as you mentioned, uh, of the Beatles and of music in general, I mean, does does that maybe give you hope when uh, you hear so many people say in uh, Nashville's, um, going the way it shouldn't be going, maybe, if you will. Well, you know, it's kind of like the music business isn't really going the <laughs> way it should be going, uh, thanks to Spotify and all those things. But, um, you know, it's the other thing of probably one of the reasons that I wrote just about everything by myself is nobody on Music Row wants to write what, what I'm writing these days. And I'm fine with that. But, um, it's just they're going where they're going, but I'm going where I want to go. And uh, there's no pressure on having to be a hit songwriter mm-hmm. or whatever. You know, you just I just write what I feel like writing. And that's so freeing compared to all the years on Music Row of, well, you need to write something up tempo positive for so and so. And, you know, you have that pressure on you all the time of who's looking and who's recording. So <laughs> this this is just like a breath of fresh air to me. And, and how rewarding is it whenever you go out on a project that, that, that you're in love with and you see the respect, the admiration of not only your peers, but the fans alike that, uh, that buy in to what your, your vision is, if you will. Yeah. It's so exciting to be able to play these songs and what, you know, I was a singer songwriter for so long, just doing the things like the bluebird and, you know, after the bluebird TV show took off, everybody around the country wants to do singer songwriter mm-hmm. things, but it's so much fun for me. And this was the thing I came up with a couple of years ago is have my band play with me as much as I can, but still tell the stories behind the song, but then play what sounds like an album cut instead of just playing you with an acoustic guitar. And it adds, I think, a whole nother flavor to the songs and people are expecting something a little different, but they love it when they hear it that way because it's like a, like a completed thing. Oh, so that's how it's going to sound. And that's really cool. And I just get a really good response from people that come get to hear the band do these things. And, and for you as a, as a songwriter who I think we've mentioned this, uh, I think I ask you this probably every time we talk, I like to find out what new songwriters are out there that, uh, that maybe, uh, have, have excited you a little bit. 
You know, it's funny. I've been in such a cocoon lately. I haven't really <laughs> come across anything that's really turning me on. Um, you know, the, it's funny. The latest, greatest thing that I love is Jason Isbell, mm -hmm. you know, and I just think he's such an incredible writer and guitar player. Um, he just, he gets to the heart of things. And that's what I love about uh, singer songwriters. And, you know, I still go back and listen to uh, Rodney Crowell and Joe Ely, who were the two people that their records brought me to Nashville, Tennessee. And um, they just hold up so well, just like the Beatles stuff holds mm -hmm. up so well after all this time. And uh, that's kind of what I'm looking for is things that are not a passing fad, because so many things on Music Row these days seems like one hit wonders or they're here and they're gone or whatever. And we're not building stars like we built stars uh, even in the nineties or whatever, you know? And um, I think part of it is because it's gotten where uh, everybody has their little clicks and they're, that's who writes the songs for the artist. And it's because there's no money and they're all trying to keep it that way. But I always looked at Garth recorded half the songs on a record were outside songs. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, he had, friends in low places and he had the dance and he had shameless that took him to different levels. And I, that's kind of what I feel like's missing these days too, is those songs that are so great that take an artist to a different level. Mm, that's right. And do, do you see artists with that potential or is, is it something that, uh, that, that maybe you don't even, it, it's not even a potential thing. You, you probably have to have it or you just don't. Right. Well, I think it can be encouraged. Um, you know, these days you look at, at songs that are being written and there's five, six, seven, eight writers on a song. And that's kind of amazing to me. Like the latest Dirks Bentley thing, I think it had eight writers on it. And I'm thinking Dirks Bentley is such a great writer. He could write a song by himself. So what's going on here? Um, but it's just the state of the industry these days that make it where everybody wants their little piece of the pie and they want to get it however they can. But to me, if they recorded some of these great songs that I hear in town um, and put them on their records rather than just have it be the whole album written by the artist, I think careers might take off in a different way. And and since uh, you made it through the whole COVID thing, the whole masks, the being separated, and all that, how what what's the uh, what's the live show mean to you uh, today as opposed to say four years ago? You know, a lot of the times it's just really emotional. Um, the very first show that I did after COVID was at the country music hall of fame, which I love playing there. And it was in the uh, Ford theater, which is one of my favorite places to play. And I started playing and people in the audience started crying and I started crying <laughs> because it was the first time there'd been live music. And it was the same way when we went into the studio, which was in 2020, probably in August. And, uh, we cut the authentic record with John Party's guys, and we all got very emotional about it because of the first time we had played since March yeah. or maybe even earlier than that, probably January for me. And uh, the audiences these days, I think they appreciate live music so much more than they did be because they were without it for two years. And I know everybody that's playing is so um, grateful that we're out there playing again and the audience is responding to it. Um, I did a private show the other night at the listing room and the response from the people and, you know, everybody wanted to talk to us afterwards. We were there like another hour and a half and it's just, they want to share with you what it meant to them to be hearing music again. And I think that's tremendous because the more we have gratitude in our lives for everything, the better yeah. off we are. Yeah, that's right. And, who are the uh, who are the folks early in your career that you're grateful for that that stood up for you that maybe uh, kept you going whenever uh, w when you were getting so many no's if you will. Well, the two people that were really influential to me was I, I played with uh, Ian Tyson for two years up in Canada, and Ian just passed away, but he to me is like the Canadian. Bob Dylan or something. He and Gordon Lightfoot were really good friends. He gave Gordon Lightfoot his uh, first hits. And um, so I played with Ian for two years, great songwriter, but he's very encouraging about my songwriting. And 
I had a Canadian band that we would play with Ian, but he would let me open the shows playing my original stuff with the band. And then he would come on and that was pretty huge. And he was very encouraging about moving down to Nashville, Tennessee for me. You know, he was trying to help me get down there. Uh, the other person was a guy, Mark Gray, who played with Exile. And um, Exile's been friends of mine. They're from Lexington, Kentucky. And I was at Sonny Lemaire's house, who's the bass player mm. for Exile. And he introduced me to Mark Gray, who was a new member in the band. And Mark was a phenomenal singer, songwriter. And so Sonny said, well, play Mark some of your songs. And I did. And he said, well, you just need to move to Nashville. And so <laughs> those two guys together uh were very influential and then harry warner who was at bmi at the time he heard a band in kentucky that was doing some of my songs and he brought them down to nashville and i got to go with them and meet harry and uh he worked for jerry reed at the time but he recorded this band and they got really close to a record deal with my songs and then RCA signed somebody else called Wild Country instead mm -hmm. of this band, and that ended up being Alabama, so yeah. I think it was probably a good <laughs> move. But all of those things were encouraging me to go to Nashville, and I went out to L.A. and checked L.A. out, and for one thing, Nashville's four hours from home, so <laughs> you know, if I ever tucked my tail between my legs, I could go four hours rather than have to catch a flight home right. from L.A., so um, it was a good move, and Nashville at that time when I moved here was such an open community, you could about walk in any door and play somebody a song. And you'd be walking down the street and you might see Reba or you might see Jerry Reed or somebody just walking from one building to the other. And I don't know if that's possible now with all the condos they have yeah. put up and the, all the things they've torn down. So it was a different time, but it was a very organic, uh, inspiring time to be in Nashville, Tennessee. Now, it, looking if you were an aspiring songwriter today kent what would what would be the biggest scary thing out there as opposed to what you were looking at uh when you were coming up uh coming into the world of technology and socials and all of that i mean how much more is there to that you have to venture through well the things that i see um one is you know, when, when I moved to town up till 2016, when they stopped making CDs and then the next year they quit putting them in cars, which I think was a conspiracy myself <laughs> because I see all your CDs still back yep. there and I still love CDs and they're still the best sounding format, but we got paid by mechanicals, which mean anytime a CD or vinyl record or a cassette at that time were sold, if we had a song on the record, we got paid. Well, when Mechanical stopped in 2016, uh, that was how you got a publishing deal and you paid them back with the Mechanicals when you had a, a hit song. And these days, there isn't that. So I don't know how a young songwriter would come to town and get a publishing deal these days. It seems like it would be much more difficult because publishers can't pay a draw like they used to because there's no money coming in. So I guess you would have to be an Uber driver or a waiter, which, you know, everybody's gone through those things when they come to town anyway. And then um, the other thing is uh, I talked to some of these new artists that I'm working with and they spend so much time getting their social numbers up that they're not really having that much time to be creative. You know, they spend a lot of their time every day trying to get their numbers up because that's what the record labels yeah. want these days. What's your, what, how, how your social numbers. And to me, that takes away from the talent. One, that record labels are looking for the numbers rather than the talent. And two, these kids are having to be something other than just being creative by working a system however they need to do it. Yeah. And it's it's a totally different world. And it just changed drastically in 2016. And um, you know, the repercussions of it are still going on. And um we, we found out what Spotify and them don't really pay. And, you know, it was a different world up till 2016. And so we're just trying to figure out how all this stuff works and how we get paid these days. And you have a, a record go platinum and you go, now explain to me how they came up with it being platinum. And there's this whole thing of all these different uh, uh, places playing your songs. And I don't know, it's very convoluted, but 
somehow or the other, they make it seem like it's platinum and you go, well, you know, I'm glad I have a platinum record. I don't understand it, but I'll take it. <laughs> I don't see the money I did when it was yeah. a platinum from a mechanical, but, uh, that's a whole nother story. Now, Kit, what do you, what do you see on the horizon as far as the opportunities being presented for, for songwriters to make the money again? The best thing that I see, and it it was kind of a blessing and a curse that the Nashville TV show was on. Um, Can't get into the Bluebird anymore, (laughs) but um, people really were woken up to what songwriters do, I think, due to that show. And so, so many different songwriter festivals have cropped up all around the country, but all around the world. And these days people that want to stay in the music business have to go out and perform and there's more outlets than there ever was for singer songwriters. And it's so good to go do some of these festivals and see the young writers that are out there because it's helping them make a living so they can write songs and be around other songwriters. And, um, that there really wasn't much of that when I came to Nashville, you know, before the bluebird and the, in the round things, there weren't really singer songwriter things anywhere. So it's, it's a different world and um, you really have to be able to perform and be willing to travel, but that's kind of what it takes these days. Mm-hmm. Now you, you talked about uh, the songwriter, the, uh, the, the, the sessions where, you know, we went to the listening room one time when I was out in Nashville and, Got to see uh, w- one of my buddies, Bridget Tatum, was playing that oh, night. Oh, yeah. And uh, Bridget is such a trip. And f- she was like the very first person I ever met when I came to Nashville. She helped me. She let me into uh, a friend's apartment that I was staying in that weekend. And uh, so so anyway, she was the first one songwriter I really made friends with that whenever I hear like she's country. I mean, when I hear she's country, I mean, I hear Bridget saying every word of that. Cause I've heard her say every one of those words. I, my question for you, who was the first one songwriter that you were able to listen to their songs and, and you were like, Oh yeah, that's so-and-so who was the first one that you were able to, to really a song you could identify him by the person. Um, it was interesting when I came, before I came to town, Rodney Crowell was one of those people. He was just so influential on what he was writing and how great he was writing and he was making things happen in Nashville. The other thing that was interesting is when I came to town, Buddy Killen, who ran Tree Publishing at the time, had a place called the Stockyard. And what he did every Thursday is he had one of his writers come in and play and a lot of them were huge writers, but they really weren't that good of singers or songwriters or, or players or whatever. Mm-hmm. But to be able to go in and hear like Curly Putnam play uh, Green Green Grass at Home or He Stopped Loving Her Today or Bobby Braddock do that. And you're sitting in this little room and here are these icon songwriters singing these icon songs and they may not even play really good or sing really good. But the emotion and the songs they wrote really had a huge impact on me. And, um, you know, it's it's just kind of one of those things that you go, well, maybe I can do this, you know, (laughs) and uh, I was already moved here. But you still are. You're always wondering, maybe I can do this. But to be able to hear these guys and uh, the cool part was one of my favorite people at that time. And he was. uh, even when I was back in Kentucky was Ray Van Hoy. And he was like 18 years old and having all these hits with Tammy and George and stuff like that. And uh, through the music business, we got to be friends a few years ago and do some shows together. And so when I got inducted to the hall of fame in 2020, I thought, why in Ray Van Hoy in the hall (laughs) of fame? I mean, I thought he would be in way before I was in, but he got in this year, which was so exciting to me because you know, that he got the 30 year inductee thing, but it's like people kind of forget who were so amazing back then. And so they opened up this new category, which to me is fantastic. And I'm so grateful that Rafe was the first one to get in there because he's still a phenomenal talent. And uh, he was an inspiration for me back in Kentucky that, you know, this could possibly happen if you move down there. 
That's right. Well, uh, again, the uh, the new album from the Beatles to the Bluebird. Uh, Kent, I always want to make sure and let folks know where they can find uh, more info about the music, where they can keep up with uh, everything you've got going on and upcoming tour dates and all that, socials as well. Well, you know, I'm, I'm not real good on the socials, <laughs> but I have somebody that helps me with it. Um, and, of course, the music's found anywhere these days. I would suggest Apple. You know, they, they do a little better on paying you. Um, but uh, if you go to my website, kentblazy.com, it's got my tour schedule coming up. And, um, you know, if somebody actually wants a CD or wants an autograph that they write me, you know, we can do that because some people still want CDs. I'd love to and, see one on my shelf back there. I'm going to have to. Well, I bet we can work that out. <laughs> have you seen the album cover? I have. That's good stuff. Yeah. It's That's pretty cool. Uh, people laugh at it, but on the back cover is the little bobblehead beetles that came out that <laughs> uh, I found at an antique store a while back. And the picture with them is me with my first guitar. And uh, I thought that was a pretty funny picture of uh, George Harrison kind of looking over his shoulder <laughs> like, oh, no, forget about it. So, uh, yeah, I had fun with the cover. I had fun with the record, and I'm just looking forward to people hearing it and um, seeing what they think. That's good. Well, well, Kent, brother, it is always such a privilege to uh, to, to have you include me in your schedule, and uh, I appreciate, oh, I gotcha. appreciate and, uh, our conversation every time, brother. And I hope everything smooths out for you and uh, – Life gets a little more flowing and easy than it's been lately. I I will take that. (laughs) That's my my wish for you. Well, I appreciate that. And uh, Kent, I look forward to talking again soon. You come back to Southwest Oklahoma, give me a ring. I look forward to it. Thank you. Well, thanks again for joining us for this episode of Good Questions with Cameron Dole. If you ever have a comment, a question, maybe anything else you'd like to know, you can hit me up on the socials. Find me on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and Facebook at the Cameron Dole. Of course, if you have a special guest idea, you can email me, gqwithcam at gmail.com. Thanks again to Brandon Allen for coming up with our theme music. We're going to let him play us out and hope you guys have a great weekend. Thanks and be ready for upcoming episode number three.